Hello and welcome to Chinese Whispers with me, Cindy Yu. Every episode, I'll be talking to journalists, experts, and longtime China watchers about the latest in Chinese politics, society, and more. There'll be a smattering of history to catch you up on the background knowledge and some context. How do the Chinese see these issues? It's clear now that Vladimir Putin's army is not as competent or as effective as he was hoping for. And while that's celebrated in much of the world, there are those in China, specifically Beijing's military leaders, who are going to be concerned about what they're seeing on the ground. Not least because of China's People's Liberation Army has been so heavily influenced, whether in terms of strategy or equipment, by the Russian army. And that is a relationship that goes back all the way to the Soviet Union days. So could the People's Liberation Army, which hasn't been in active combat since 1979 in Vietnam, similarly flounder if a war were to happen. To discuss, I'm joined by Timothy R. Heath, who's a senior researcher at the American think tank, the Rand Corporation, and Professor Lee Xiaobing, who's a military historian who used to serve in the People's Liberation Army himself. Now, Tim and Xiaobing, welcome to Chinese Whispers. To start with, I wondered if we can give an overview of the current weaknesses and strengths of the PLA. Tim, can we talk about its size? Because am I right in thinking that it's the world's largest army? What are the implications of that in terms of how effective it is? <clears throat> well, the PLA is the world's largest military, if you count by sheer number of personnel. However, um, that metric by itself does not tell us a lot. There are a lot of countries with huge militaries like North Korea, uh, which has a disproportionately large military given its small size as a country. Um, but as we know, North Korea is not especially modern or powerful as a, as a military force. What makes the PLA distinctive is not just the size, but how modern uh, it has become over the past few decades. It, it has made leaps and bounds, so to speak, in terms of improving the quality of weapons and equipment and in some of the key organizational reforms that, that are, are uh, really quite impressive. Mm. So maybe you can just give us an overview of those reforms that have come. I mean, am I right in thinking that a lot of them have come under Xi Jinping as well? Yes, I, I agree with uh, Tim say about the uh, general description of the People's Liberation Army, especially in the, the recent years, uh, not just uh, maintain the number, I mean, one and a half million uh, active troops, but also there's improvement of the uh, uh, quality, like uh, Tim mentioned, uh, modernization or education. Uh, before the reform, uh, most of the new recruits from the rural areas, now it's about 40% of the PLA soldiers from the urban areas with, with some kind of education, um, at least with the high school uh, graduates. So uh, for the office core, now it's about 60% of the PLA officers with a college degree, uh, much better than, higher than a pre-reform period. So you mean reform in terms and opening. of both, yeah. Uh, quantity and quality, there's a, we face a different army. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And can we talk a little bit about the equipment and the technology of it as well, Timothy? I mean, how does it fare compared to other major armies or say the American one in terms of what weapons it has, um, what uh, boats and ships? Here is my technical knowledge coming sure. out here. <laughs> um, how far does that extend? Well, I think <clears throat> the improvements in the hardware are probably one of the strengths of the PLA, and we'll get to the weaknesses. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, missiles in particular, the PLA is actually quite advanced. They have some of the world's most advanced ballistic missiles that are very accurate and can go very long ranges. They pose a real threat to the U.S. Navy, for example, um, and its desire to operate close to China. Um, China has also improved the quality of its warships, the surface ships in particular, destroyers, have very good surface-to-air missile capabilities and uh, improved uh, uh, sensors and overall <clears throat> reduced uh, signatures, which makes them a little bit harder to detect. Um, the Chinese uh, Air Force has improved a lot of its aircraft. 
They have fourth generation aircraft. Um, they still uh, have weaknesses in producing quality engines and depend on Russian engines in particular. But uh, overall, the combat capability of the latest Chinese aircraft is comparable, if not quite at the level of the U.S. They are getting closer to the quality of U.S. aircraft. Ground troops have generally lagged um, in modernization efforts. Um, but compared to a lot of China's neighbors, the PLA ground forces are more than a match. Mm-hmm. And Xiaoping, what about um, those weaknesses then? Where, where do you think they lie? Well, they, uh, as uh, Timothy mentioned here, uh, there is a gap between the uh, technology and the uh, operation. Some of those the high-tech weapons uh, haven't been uh, tested or, or used before. Uh, they show, you know, during their parade and celebration, and they're available. Uh, but uh, how it works, you know, really uh, during the real combat situation uh, has been uh, tested yet. So there's a gap between the technology and the operation in terms of the uh, weapon system. And also, there is a, a issue about the combat effectiveness. Even though we talk about the number, the uh, year of, you know, but uh, uh, PLA hasn't fought a war in several decades. You know, the last large scale war we know was the war between. China and Vietnam in 1980s, about uh, 40 years ago. So without recent experience, the current generation of the PLA officer and the troops still faced a serious uh, issue about their combat effectiveness. That's why the PLA had conducted a frequent uh, exercises try to improve their combat effectiveness, but there's no proof about how they're going to be during the real battle. I think it's helpful to look at the Russian experience in the Ukraine um, because the Chinese military imitates the Russian military in many ways, and, and there are a lot of similarities. What we see in the Russian case is uh, a military that did a lot of training, did a lot of exercises, has advanced weapon systems, but it is the problems of corruption, problems of uh, of uh, authoritarian control that that makes officers and troops hide problems and and uh, uh, be afraid to tell what's what the real situation is. These are the kind of issues that have plagued the Russian combat performance, and I think there's a real reason to uh, suspect that if the Chinese went to combat as well their own problems with corruption and uh, lack of preparation, lack of honesty in the ranks uh, would reveal themselves pretty quickly in the performance on the battlefield. Well, that's really interesting point you make, Timothy, about corruption. Uh, Xiaoping, because the PLA has the second largest military budget uh, in, in the world. I mean, obviously, it's still only a third of roughly what the American one is, but it's still pretty big. Do you think that money is well used at the moment? Because President Xi did go on an anti-corruption drive, you know, when he first came to power. So has that had effect? Yes. Yeah. The military budget uh, has increased annually. Uh, this year, again, up to uh, 7% from last year. But uh, Xi Jinping and his uh, military leaders justify the increase, believe they're still, you know, below two uh, percent of the total GDP and much less than other countries like United States and uh, several others. So, uh, but uh, PLA does need a, a big budget to upgrade their weapon system because their uh, technology uh, depended on uh, foreign purchase and uh, importation. So they need a cash flow to buy the weapons like from Russia, the Su-35, 
uh, fighters. So China had been the largest buyer of Russian uh, airplanes in the past decade. So uh, there's a uh, issues between the military and the uh, administration about the uh, budget. So to ensure the military uh, loyalty and the support. So she continued to increase the budget in the recent years. Let's talk about Russia then, because that's already come up um, a couple of times so far. Tim, I think it's fair to say that Russian, the Russian troops haven't performed as well in Ukraine as many had feared and they had hoped. So do you think that the People's Liberation Army will be watching from within China to see if what their mistakes are and how that, what that means for the PLA itself? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Russia is a close partner of China. And a lot of the PLA's organization, equipment, doctrine, all, a lot of that is inspired by the Russian military and the Russian experience. Um, and even today, a lot of the practices of the PLA are similar to how the Russian military practices or operates. For example, there's, there's a reliance in Russia and China on conscription uh, for a sizable portion of the enlisted force. And the Chinese military has pervasive problems of corruption, especially in its logistic systems, just like the Russian military does. Um, there is also a strong political uh, flavor to the PLA, obviously as a political army, but uh, you know the Russian military similarly is a very politicized military with a strong emphasis on obedience to uh, you know Putin, President Putin. So a lot of the issues that we're seeing in the Russian military are going to be of high concern to the PLA because there's a very good chance the Chinese military could have some of the similar issues. When you say corruption, is that still an issue now? Um, just going back to you know this thought that presidency did have an anti-corruption drive, did that not affect the army? Well, it definitely affected the army and it took out a lot of officers, but the corruption is certainly a pervasive issue. Uh, and the corruption is mainly concentrated in two parts of the military. The logistics system, where there's a lot of money changing hands and, and supplies that are easily lost track of. Uh, that's historically where a lot of the corruption have, has affected the PLA. By the way, it's also where a lot of the corruption has uh, hit the Russian military and, and shown to be a serious problem. And then the other part of the PLA that suffers corruption issues is the political department, the, the department responsible for promotions. And the issue what you have there is that people will pay to be promoted uh, and to move up. And uh, that, that has been a problem. It continues to be a problem. And it affects the ability of the Chinese leadership to have confidence in the PLA because they just don't know who in command is actually deserving and competent enough to carry out the, uh, the military duties and who is not. Well, the classic Chinese guanxi, the relationship building um, network. <laughs> um, yes. And Xiaobing, some people have said, and I mean, I can see the merit in this argument, which is that watching how the Russian army has fared in Ukraine makes China think twice about any military action against Taiwan. Do you think that's similar? That's a fair argument from a military standpoint? Could the Chinese army similarly flounder because of its influence by the Russian side um, in, a, in a military engagement? Uh, at uh, a strategic level, no. But uh, at the operational level, yes. At a strategic level, China considers Taiwan as different uh, from the Ukraine. And uh, China would uh, play the different war game if invasion took place. But as uh, Tim C mentioned here, China Chinese military has been watching the war closely. So sure, they learning from uh, Russians lessons and they would uh, make uh, changes, adjustment in their operation to deal with the battleground situation, like you know, supply line, like uh, people's support you know, make sure they, they are good with people's war. They not uh, engage in a hostile uh, territory. They need uh, friendly support from local level. So they're learning and they 
uh, learn from the Russian army. And Tim, you mentioned just now that the People's Liberation Army is a political army. Let's talk about that because it's not your usual army. It's not a national institution because it's one that technically answers to the Chinese Communist Party. Can you talk about that structure a little? Certainly. <clears throat> so the PLA is technically a party army. That is, it is the armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party. And therefore, it is not answerable to the nation of China. It's answerable to the Communist Party. And its ultimate goal is to protect the Communist Party. So what that means is that a lot of the command structure and the political controls in the military is designed to ensure that the party's authority is unquestioned and is not necessarily designed to ensure maximum military effectiveness. There are party committees, for example, that oversee decision-making at, at almost all levels of the military and, and they supervise the commander. Uh, there are political commissars who, whose job is partly to keep an eye on the leadership and check their political reliability. And there's an ex extensive emphasis on political indoctrination and, and political training in the PLA uh, that you don't find in, in non-party militaries. And a lot of these political controls erode or, or uh, start to uh, cause friction in the PLA's efforts to become a highly efficient, lethal combat machine because they have to spend a lot of resources and energy uh, ensuring compliance with all these political directives, political controls, and uh, political oversight. And am I right in thinking that because of this, it's also subject to political turmoil? For example, during the Cultural Revolution, it also was subject to purges. Well, historically, that has been a huge issue with uh, party armies is they can be prone to factional infighting. The latest example we saw in China was uh, Bo Xilai. There were reports that parts of the PLA had been approached by Bo Xilai and his cronies, and there were efforts to solicit support for military uh, aid if Bo Xilai decided to, to take really risky actions towards the central leadership. It never came to that, but... The Chinese, after Bo Xilai's downfall, did, the Chinese authorities reportedly did carry out some investigations to uh, figure out which parts of the PLA may have been tempted to uh, support this factional uh, leader. Yeah, and, and that's not the first time that the PLA has been used for political purposes. During the Cultural Revolution, though it had its fair share of purges and fractures, it was also what Mao relied on to regain control of the Red Guards. So, Abin, can you tell us about what the Cultural Revolution did for the PLA's power? So during the Cultural Revolution, uh, PLA moved into the political center. And uh, in return, as Tim C mentioned here, actually party uh, dependent army, or in other words, the PLA saved the Chinese Communist Party during the Cultural Revolution. But it did again, you know, in Tiananmen Square in 1989, again, the army saved the party. So during the political crisis, a uh, party always turned to the military and depended on the military. So they want to make sure uh, this army is served party's interest. But you've also written about how the PLA or some people in it refused to carry out the orders, for example, during the Tiananmen protest. Is that right? Yes. Since uh, many of the recruitment took place in the uh, same area, so many of the soldiers uh, knew each other before they joined the army. So they tried to uh, be a good soldier, try to join the party during their service and uh, get a promotion, prepare for their, their future. But of course, that's they just, you know, their hope and their wish. But when that reality took place, you know, Tiananmen Square, when they have to open the fire to the students and the citizens, uh, many soldiers changed their mind. So according to official statistics, there are about the 1,400 soldiers dropped the weapon and uh, left the site or run away. About the 211 officers refused. I mean, this at the operational level, commanders on the front, 
211 officers refused to carry the order. There's many more, you know, at the higher level, but at operational level, those uh, foot soldier and the field officers uh, changed their mind during the Tiananmen Square event. That's amazing because I think we've seen a, a low level, to be sure, a low level of similar phenomenon happening in the Russian army over the last couple of months. Tim, do you think something similar might happen with PLA soldiers if China conducted, um, and I'm sorry to make draw equivalence here again or draw a comparison here to Taiwan or just anywhere else, um, because I am aware that it's a bit of a overdone comparison. But do you think that, um, you know, soldiers might say, we don't want to fight people that look like us, speak like us, uh, for, in terms of the PLA? Yes, yeah, that happened during the Korean War and during China's war with Vietnam. 20,000 Chinese soldiers were captured during the Korean War. After the war, 70% of the Chinese POWs didn't want to go back to China and they went to Taiwan. Uh, so that's really embarrassing for the Chinese government in the Cold War. So they de- developed this suicide pill issue to each soldiers before the battle. And the uh, Chinese army is still one of the few army in the today's world to issue the suicide pill to the soldiers. That's never heard in uh, American military, <laughs> not even in the Russian troops. If you, you can s- surrender, you know, you can, but not for the Chinese. They call it the glory appeal. Okay, give you something like a Tylenol, you know, small pill. Each soldier received one. And uh, when you lost ability to fight, you need to take the pill instead of being captured. So that was a pretty uh, serious uh, issue during the war with Vietnam in 1979, 1985, still a large number of Chinese troops, including female soldiers captured by the Vietnamese troops. Wow, and, um, and that's to stop them from defecting if they were captured? Yes. Right, I see. And Tim, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, I thought I'd make a, offer a few points about the PLA's role in suppressing domestic opposition to the party, and then uh, any thoughts uh, and some thoughts about the Russia experience in the Ukraine and what it might mean for Taiwan. So one point I'd make about Tiananmen Square is that the experience of the PLA was such a shock. Uh, for the military and for the political party, the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, that a decade later, the Chinese government um, took the PLA out of the job of suppressing domestic uh, dissent and gave them an explicit set of orders to just focus on external threats. They instead created a new service, the People's Armed Police, the PAP, and they created it by carving out large chunks of the army and turning them into this paramilitary service whose job was to uh, crush domestic uh, dissent or opposition and communist rule. So I think that creation of the PAP and the reorientation of the PLA shows just how damaging that Tiananmen Square experience was to the, the morale of the PLA, to the people's confidence and trust in the military and in the communist party. Uh, and, and ever since then, uh, you know, evidence suggests that people who serve in the PLA are definitely much more comfortable, much more proud to be focused on external threats and do not want to be uh, put back in the job of uh, crushing domestic opposition, even though that is ultimately one of their most basic missions that is always available if the PAP and other law enforcement f- fails to do their job. Um, the, the point about Russia I'd make is that I think there is an important difference uh, between the Russian experience and any potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. First, um, the Russian invasion was carried out on some uh, uh, false pretenses, at least for a lot of Russian conscripts. They they didn't understand uh, the mission and they were deceived uh, with propaganda about what would happen and what they were trying to do. 
And that, that was a huge issue for a lot of the troops who were shocked when they find out, to find out that uh, this was not a, you know, some kind of mission where you just walk into Ukraine and, and the people welcome you and there's no fighting. They were misled. And, and that's a reason why a lot of Russian soldiers threw down their arms and have fled and surrendered or defected. Um, in the Chinese case, there's been extensive propaganda to try to teach the Chinese people and the PLA that they had this you know, sacred mission to liberate Taiwan. That said, you know, I do think I, I have my own suspicions that if a war broke out, um, there is a possibility that Chinese troops could be shocked to find when they cross the, the strait um, that they are killing these folks who look a lot like them, who don't want to be a part of China, who are fighting hard to defend their own freedom. And, um, you know, some of the similar issues of doubt and low morale and uh, questioning of the cause that the Russians are experiencing in Ukraine, I could easily see that playing out in large parts of the PLA during a bloody, murderous attack on, on Taiwan that involved the slaughter of large numbers of civilians. And Tim, I wondered from you, um, could you talk a little bit about the strategic thinking uh, that the PLA might have towards war? I.e., is there a war with Chinese characteristics? Um, when to wage war uh, theory with Chinese characteristics? Um, for example, you yourself have written about two phases of strategy, uh, pre and post Mao. Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> there there is the operational doctrine of how do you fight if directed by the leadership. And the Chinese definitely have a well-articulated doctrine of uh, what they call informatized war, Xin Shi Hua, Zhang Zhang. And that's the idea that you fight a war with digital technologies that allow all fighters, you know, aircraft, ships, tanks in a network um, that can communicate with each other, share data, target uh, different platforms and, and pass on that targeting da- uh, data. And that allows a a joint force, an integrated joint force to uh, fight as a cohesive whole rather than everybody fighting on their own. So there, there's a well-articulated doctrine on that. Um, in terms of when or why the PLA may fight, that's a political decision. That is ultimately only known to the leadership of China. My own assessment is that the Chinese leadership currently do not have an interest or desire to provoke a war with any of their neighbors, um, including Taiwan, and that they recognize that the, they have other priorities right now, in particular the economy, trying to get that uh, on a, you know, sustain, sustainable, the growth, and overcome some of the severe imbalances, managing relations with, with the U.S. and with uh, China's neighbors, um, and, and just managing the domestic political situation. Xi Jinping is, is constantly facing challenges by his own fellow elites and um, and the situation in China is, is hardly what you could say completely stable. So he, they've got serious challenges there as well. So given that, all of those economic and political and international challenges, it's hard to see a reason for the Chinese to want to provoke a war. And there's no evidence that I can see that the Chinese leadership have an interest in do that anytime soon. As well as COVID, of course. And the challenge of COVID is uh, yeah, the country's in lockdown. Uh, They've got some real challenges on the leadership's hands right now. Some people might say that this is the ideal time to wage a war because it distracts from the domestic problems. What do you think about that argument? I don't buy that argument at all. I don't see how war improves the situation at all. It makes it, frankly, all worse. Um, the biggest problem with starting war is that, you, you, like all wars, you can't, and the Russians are experiencing this, you can't end the war when you want to because the other side gets a vote. So the Chinese could start a war that ends up causing the economy to crash in China and and maybe uh, people get so angry and fed up with their uh, what's happening to their lives. They start protesting in larger numbers. The situation could easily spiral out of control. And, um, you know, it it seems like there's no way a war would help improve China's situation today. And in all likely ways, it would just make it far, far worse. Mm. And shopping, you know, uh, we're speaking about all of this quite academically, but you yourself have served in the People's Liberation Army. Can you talk a little bit about why you joined? And I think for audience members, you know, it's, it's interesting to know that even your name, Xiaobing, is little soldier. So your parents had had this in mind for you. Well, that, that uh, means a lot since my parents served and then uh, they hope, you know, I will follow the family tradition. <laughs> 
So that's, they gave me the name Little Soldier. Uh, back then it was pretty popular, you know, so a lot of people use uh, a Bing <laughs> in part of their name and many Chinese served. During my service, you know, in the early 70s, the total uh, PLAs numbered about 6 million. That's a large army, 6 million. And again, that's the, since during the Cultural Revolution, no uh, education, no college to go, no employed opportunity. So join the army could, you know, provide a better future. So uh, many uh, youth like me after high school like to uh, join army to avoid manual labors and uh, farm works. So that was a, a popular decision back then in the early 1970s. And uh, during the service, you know, easy for uh, the soldiers to join the uh, CCP, Chinese Communist Party. After you became a party member, that's your job security. Easier to find a girlfriend after your service and uh, <laughs> you can get a promotion and pay raise, which is a political ticket. So, but the, all of a sudden the thing changed, you know, because I served in Heilongjiang along the Russian border. So we were told the Russians are coming and there was a border crisis during that time. So we became very nervous because of the wars coming upon us. We were not well trained, not well equipped. So we belong to the uh, district uh, military command, not belong to the field army command, considered as the second class, like a national guard, the local defense force, not well equipped. But uh, we are lucky the war didn't uh, broke out. And uh, after uh, second year, uh, I left military and uh, get a better job. You know, I joined the army before I was a farmer, and then after service, I became a oil field worker in Da Qing, uh, petroleum oil field. So that's my brief service during the early seventies. And as you say, um, the PLA has changed quite a lot over the decades because now it's having um, close links to cutting edge scientists within China and universities. And it's even had a role in the vaccine development with CanSino um, and Chen Wei, this epidemiologist who's at the Ac Academy of Medical Military Sciences, who is also reportedly a PLA major general. So could you talk a little bit about that push to have, I guess, more brains in the, in the operation? Is that a a strategic move to have more um, highly educated people involved. Yeah, that's also happened, believe it or not, during the Cultural Revolution, when uh, Mao Zedong shut down all the schools and research institute, when all the intellectuals educated became the target of the revolution, somehow the military stepped in, including Nie Rongzhen, Ye Jianying, and they created military research institute to attract or recruit those uh, professors, researchers, and uh, scientists to serve in the military. Mm. So from then on, after 70s and 80s, PLA developed intellectual power. They built their own research lab in their military institutes and uh, uh, academics and began to design and manufacture their own warship, submarine, and uh, airplanes. So thereafter, uh, in the 80s and 90s, during the reforming movement, some of the, their second turning point, military research tried to leave the PLA. You know why? Mm -hmm. But they don't pay that much. You know, other people in the society uh, get better income. So Deng tried to save the army, like you said, corruption. Actually, he started allowing the military to run business, commercialization of the PLA, to keep the intellectuals in the military by compensating them with their own uh, benefits. Second jobs. 
Right. So, so he, even you know, Jiang Zemin uh, terminated the commercialization, and uh, but somehow he trade off with the military. I give you pay raise. I increase your budget, so you don't have to get the in uh, you know under the table through the illegal channel. So here is what you want. So with Jiang Zemin's uh, payback, what the done? What the military believe done on the military? Now Jiang say I pay you back, and then so military keep the intellectuals. So until today, uh, they had pretty uh, strong uh, program in terms of uh, uh, aerospace technology uh, and other re research area, including the nuclear uh, research and the development. So they may have the uh, best uh, people and resources in the military. It's not in the private sector like here in the Great Britain and America, but the PLA maintain their leading role Mm. international research. That's fascinating. Tim, am I right in thinking that there's quite a live debate going on stateside at the moment about Chinese scientists um, working or coming from uh, institutions where media reports say that they are linked to the PLA? Um, I'm not sure what those links necessarily are in these reports, but in America, it does seem like there is quite a uh, suspicion at the moment about cutting edge scientists, possibly actually just working for the People's Liberation Army. How legitimate do you think those concerns are? <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> I do think it is accurate to say that the Chinese military and the Chinese government uh, are interested and actively seeking to acquire technology from Western countries. Even though I agree with Xiao Bing that <clears throat> the PLA has dramatically improved the quality of its personnel in terms of education and technical expertise, by the own estimates of the PLA, the Chinese are lagging behind the West badly. A lot of their most advanced weapon systems are, are frankly ripoffs of Russian designs. The Chinese innovations are mostly refinements and slight improvements to either US or Russian designs and uh, systems. And therefore, um, to get the most advanced technologies, the Chinese have struggled to be the innovators and have instead turned to um, foreign acquisition through uh, espionage if necessary. Now, that said, <clears throat> although I think that, uh, there's plenty of evidence that the Chinese government and the Chinese military are actively seeking uh, through espionage to acquire Western technology, you know, it is a fair debate in Western democratic societies about how much you want to uh, characterize the work of ethnic Chinese citizens as acts of espionage. Um, there's a whole debate on that, that, you know, it's kind of a, a sideshow to what we're talking about here. And, and there are legitimate questions of certain cases uh, in which perhaps the Western governments went too far. But certainly there's been some cases that uh, the, the evidence has been pretty overwhelming that individuals have been caught uh, spying for China. So it, I, I think, frankly, it's a sensitive issue in Western countries. They're trying to balance respect and uh, care for their ethnic Chinese compatriots with legitimate concerns about espionage directed by the Chinese government. And finally, Xiaobing, I, I wanted to get your take on the place that the PLA holds in the in the Chinese mindset, the Chinese heart, because I feel like the notion of the Jiang the Liberation Army, has been an integral part of patriotic stories. Um, this idea that they are for the people, uh, that they have noble self sacrifice. You know, stories like Lei Feng, this twenty two year old PLA soldier who was this modern day communist saint for being so self sacrificial, um, taught throughout schools in China. China. Do, do you think that um, people buy that narrative and do you see the army of a party, of the ruling party, not of the country, as we've already talked about? Do they see them that army with that kind of endearment that um, those in Beijing would like them to? Yeah, this is still true to, to today. The party and the country uh, praised uh, military as the great war, as the uh, symbol of the country. Yes, I think that... Uh, uh, China continued 
uh, to promote uh, the PLA and uh, push the PLA uh, as a symbolic or political uh, machine to maintain uh, not only the security safety and also the unity and the stability of the country. They believe as long as the army is stable and uh, trustful, loyal, uh, China uh, is safe. So military is very important for the party and for the country. Mm. So uh, during the crisis like pandemic, earthquake, or any other disasters, uh, people and party always uh, tend to the military for the help. So, but that could be another way, you know, when there's a international crisis or US-China relations uh, turn uh, bad, party may use a military as a tool uh, to put the pressure on the US. Doesn't have to be attack on Taiwan. It could be a little conflict over somewhere in South China Sea. So put a little bit more pressure on the US to improve the relations in terms of trade, technology, and, and other matters. So military always used by the party, different way, you know, that the so it could be used by the party again as an instrument to improve the relations between China and the US. By starting something somewhere else. Or a crisis. I, I think Xiaobing is talking about like, you know, a small crisis. I don't think the Chinese want Yeah, to... noises or problem, not real military conflict, but they had attention. So US have to talk to me now, you know, if not, going to be something bad happen. So that's military could be used in that way. I see. Yeah. And in China today, do today's young people, I don't know if you would know this, uh, still want to join the People's Liberation Army? Yeah. So there's there's some evidence, you know, reporting provided by the Chinese media that suggests uh, for rural people, Joining the PLA is still very attractive. Unfortunately for those young people, that is not the demographic that the PLA is trying to attract. They're trying to attract educated college people, and those young people are not as interested in serving in the PLA. And in fact, there have been reports where uh, the Chinese government has had to punish young people who refused to serve and disobeyed when they were conscripted. And, and, uh, and so... And the Chinese military has lowered standards for college educated people to get in. Um, so they're relaxing rules and trying all kinds of ways to incentivize college educated urban people to join the PLA, but they still are not getting the numbers they need. And that continues to be an issue for uh, the PLA. Yeah, the, there, were, there were changes, you know, during the, after the Cultural Revolution, during the 80s and the 2000. For example, there's a, a one child policy uh, after 79. So most of the Chinese family uh, had only one child. Of course, parents did not want his only son to serve in the military. So that time, the military had the problem with their uh, recruitment. Mm. And then during the uh, 2000, because of the uh, commercialization, globalization, and uh, any job, as, uh, the job market became uh, open. So military wasn't the best way to get where you want to go. So military lost their uh, leverage, uh, but they start a new program. Like, what do, I don't know what to call it in the Great Britain, but in America they call it ROTC, the Student Cadet pro, uh, Program. So the university like uh, Beijing University, Tsinghua University began to recruit student slash officer to the university. After their graduation, they agreed to serve in the military for certain years. So through those uh, educational program, uh, PLA still keep trying to get the best uh, for the service in the recent years. Li Xiaobing and Timothy Heath, thank you so much for joining Chinese Whispers.
Thank you for watching this episode of Chinese Whispers. If you've just come across the podcast on YouTube, you can find more episodes through searching for Chinese Whispers wherever you get your podcasts from. There is a brilliant backlog of episodes not on YouTube. And if you have feedback, do leave a comment below, preferably constructive. And subscribe to the Spectator's YouTube channel so you never miss any of our Spectator TV shows. Thanks for watching.